Welcome to Factory Forward, the podcast dedicated to advancing manufacturing and propelling factories into the future. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Bob Emiliani with us. In this episode, Dr. Emiliani will share his insights on the most critical misconceptions about lean in manufacturing, the fundamental differences between lean and the Toyota production system, and the challenges leaders face when implementing lean principles. Now, meet your host, Zishan Zia, CEO and co-founder of Retrocausal, a company that employs cutting-edge generative AI in the form of its co-pilot software to boost quality, productivity, safety, and traceability of manual assembly processes. Here's Zishan Zia. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Bob Emiliani, a distinguished engineer, a pioneering researcher, and a celebrated author whose profound contributions to lean management have reshaped how organizations operate. With numerous influential books and articles, Dr. Emiliani continues to inspire leaders and organizations around the world to strive for excellence and respect in all aspects of their operations. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for joining. Hey, Sean. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Bob, I'll, I'll jump straight in uh, because I can't, can't okay. wait to ask you some of these questions. Uh, what do you think are the most critical misconceptions about lean in manufacturing today? Uh, um, I think um, there, there's a so few of them. To begin with, yeah. Yeah, let's do a couple of them or three of them or whatever. Um, so misconception number one is that uh, value stream maps, A3 reports, gamble walks, coaching, and kata can be adequate substitute for Kaizen. And and I mean, uh, in particular, Toyota style Kaizen. Um you know, the, all of these tools that I just described were derived from Kaizen practice, yet they are used outside of the context of Kaizen. Uh, and therefore, uh, used outside of that context, the results that are you're going to achieve are going to be much less than what you get from using them within the context of Kaizen. Also, as part of that uh, is the creativity associated with uh, Toyota style Kaizen that is missing typically from those other things that I mentioned, value stream maps, A3 reports, et cetera, through Kata. Um, another misconception is that uh, lean is for operations, not for the entire company. So if, if, if we simply do a simple thing and recognize that all work is made up of processes and all processes has cus have customers and suppliers and that all processes contain waste, unevenness, and unreasonableness, or as Ono said, unnecessaries, uh, and that all processes can be improved, meaning simplified, made easier, done in a way without trade-offs and so forth, then lean applies uh, to all parts of the company, all companies and all industries. But because of the origins in manufacturing, the origins in operation, uh, you know, lean is seen primarily as, as, as that, you know, an operations thing or a manufacturing thing. And, and then with that is the general association of uh, operations as being a cost center, which is ludicrous, as if no other part of the company is a cost center. In fact, you would um, more accurate to say, you know, um, that operations is, is, is where you make your money. It's the profit center and everything else. Uh, I'm exaggerating a bit, of course, but everything else is a cost center. I mean, if we're going to use that construct of what's a cost center, well, then it's clearly not operations. But anyway, that's how people view things. A third misconception is that lean is common sense. And of course, if that were true, then uh, you know leaders would have transitioned to this long before the term ever got coined in 1988 by uh, uh, John Krafchick and popularized by Jim Womack and Dan Jones. Uh, the old classical management, what I call the, you know, the old way of leading and managing, would have been displaced by uh, you know, scientific management, the predecessor to lean more than 100 years ago. So it's not common sense. I, I, I love that. I really appreciate it. Some, you know, slightly controversial statements to start with. Uh, so, so, Bob, why, in that case, <laughs> why do you think, you know, uh, leadership remains attached to those classical constructs and, and yeah. why don't they... Uh, uh, you know, ad adopt despite all of these yeah. benefits of lean methodologies. Yeah, they were they remain committed to to classical management because simply because it maximizes their status, rights, and privileges. Right. Um, you know, from the perspective of top leaders, lean corrupts 
classical management. Lean is, uh, you know, when you think about it in detail, the respect for people, the experimentation, you know, this, uh, the experimentation, for example, um, uh, kind of uh, word, conflicts with things like, oh, you have to have a plan, you have to have a Gantt chart, you have to do it exactly this way and so forth. And when we're experimenting, we're just trying out ideas and it doesn't follow a plan. So that and many other things, respect for people and so on, uh, you know, makes lean everything that most leaders do not want. And, uh, you know, and to a significant extent, it democratizes the workplace. You know, where, where a worker can challenge the boss and the boss says, do this. And the workers say, well, you know, what are the facts? And, uh, you know, why are we doing this? And that doesn't make sense. And we should, you know, should experiment differently around, the, you know, a different subject than what you're talking about. So lean is not seen as an improvement in uh, management practice. And, and of course, in classical management, waste is a feature, not a bug. And leaders are, are well known to be, uh, you know, wasteful in terms of their, their, their own spending, uh, both personally and within the company because it's loaded with waste and unevenness and unreasonableness. So um, uh, that's, these are some of the reasons why it, uh, you know, classical management continues uh, along with us today. And where you do see, I mean, we all know the most lean that you see is um, the application of the so-called lean tools without the respect for people principle, what I've turned out 20, 25 years ago is fake lean. And, um, and then when you do see these examples of great so-called lean transformations, it typically is um, uh, actually a transformation from batch and queue processing to flow, a change from classical management to progressive management led by people like ex-Toyota people or Shingajitsu Kaizen consultants. It's not actually a lean transformation. It's a transformation from classical management to a Toyota-style management system. Uh, so all of these great so-called lean transformations are actually TPS type of Toyota management system type right. of transformations, not actually lean. So Bob, what's the difference between lean and the Toyota production system? And wh why do you? you know, lean, lean, well, lean is basically a Western interpretation of Toyota's management system. Lean started out as lean production, then around 2007 shifted over to the phrase lean management because people were realizing it had broader application than just within operations and so on. Um, and, and, and the respect for people principle wasn't brought into the lean community until 2007. When if you'd study the history of progressive management, even going back to the day, days of Fred Taylor and scientific management and Frank Woolard at Morris Motors and so forth, they had these same ideas. They gave them different names, but they had these same ideas going back uh, a long time. So the complaint within, you know, lean world with folks like Jim Womack in a recent podcast with Mark Rabin is that, you know, the, that people latched on to the tools and, uh, forgot about respect for people. Well, that's because it wasn't talked about for 20 years. And then in 2007, it was, uh, you know, to Jim Womack's credit though, and, and Dan Jones and, and, uh, in the book machine that changed the world, which was also co-authored by, um, uh, uh, Roos, R O O S. I forgot his first name, but anyway, they did, do, they did do a good job of describing the system, you know, not just tools, but the system. The integration with supply chain and product development and stuff like that and then they then um and lean thinking also with its vignettes of wire mold and porsche and so forth was describing the system but the institutes that they started uh lean enterprise institute and lean enterprise academy basically still sell tools i mean they talk a little bit about systems but basically you know they're selling tools so you have this you know conflict between you know, what the market wants and, and what the, uh, you know, the authors who founded these institutes uh, the wrote about. Um, so anyway, there's substantial differences between the two. And, and when I've seen, you know, these uh, Japanese senseis, ex-Toyota people and Toyota Kosei people talk about something like 5S that, you know, everybody thinks they know. I mean, they would eat, these guys with 30, 40, 50 years of experience would argue amongst themselves about the meaning of that. Uh, and, and, and it's, they don't have, you know, they don't have a fixed understanding of it. It evolves as their thinking evolves. So my point is, is lean tends to not evolve, uh, the way 
you know, the Toyota people think about things and evolve. And so there's some substantial differences in understanding and translation errors, lots of translation errors from Japanese right. to English and literally just, yeah. just lagging behind, you know, lean lags behind where it should be given the access that the top folks in lean world have to Toyota people. Anyway. That, that's fantastic. I, I, I get it. Uh, that, that makes sense. So, Bob, then, then how, how do you do it? What, what's the, what, what changes should leaders be making to effectively implement lean principles in their organizations? What's the right way to do it? I think everybody knows Art Byrne, the retired CEO of the wire mill company. And as he says, quote, everything must change, unquote. Now, of course, most top leaders don't want to hear that because they don't want to change. They don't want everything to change. And they themselves don't want to change. You know, when you're at the top as a CEO or some other high level, there's um, not a whole lot of reason to change. Your focus more uh, is on, uh, you know, execution of whatever the plan is and to, to some extent survival in, in your position. Um, you know, so they want others to change. And so, you know, lean involves an entirely different set of preconceptions, beliefs, behaviors, and competencies to achieve you know, just in time, a flow of materials and information and to do all the wonderful stuff that you see within Toyota's management system, not just within the shop, but in the office and in the executive suites as well. And uh, so this is what, what makes a so-called uh, you know, transformation, which is also another dirty word for a lot of uh, top leaders. Uh, it makes it so difficult to achieve. Um, you know, people, Businesses would still rather process material and information in a batch and queue fashion. And it still is uh, rewarded, at least from, from material processing, from an accounting standpoint, that even if you overproduce, it's still a massive value of the company. And the less material you have on hand, the less value the company uh, has. So, um, so, you know, they're continuing to do things the old way. But yeah, everything must change if you want to effectively implement this in an organization. And it needs the kind of leader who's obviously willing to question everything. Most leaders have the attitude of whatever is, is right. right. And, you know, in, in Toyota world, it's the attitude of whatever is, is wrong. Uh, you know, Kaizen fundamentally suggests a dissatisfaction with the status quo. That even if you made a huge improvement, today that th tomorrow it'll be whatever is is right it'll you know it'll soon become uh, static and out of date and in need of improvement and so this is a hard thing for people to accept right oh, yeah bob another kind of transformation these days that we hear a lot about is a digital transformation yeah. how does kaizen fit into the uh, world yeah. of digital transformation how, how do they interact and live together? Well, certainly, you know, when you replace physical processes with digital processes is to not fundamentally eliminate the need for Kaizen or the principle of respect for people or respect for humanity or whatever. And digital processes probably require greater greater attention uh, to, to both. Uh, uh, you've all, uh, We've all heard about, you know, people digitizing bad processes and then you get a bad digital process, you know, so... We want to improve the process and then digitize it. But even that kind of locks you into a certain way of doing things and makes it harder to change. Um, but nevertheless, anyway, um, Kaizen is necessary whether the, the era we live in is analog or digital. Kaizen is just fundamental to uh, humanity, you know, and human existence of, of, of recognizing problems and going through trial and error attempts to correct the problem. Uh, so it's it just it's just fundamental to our waste of way of being. The waste doesn't go away when computers arrived a long time ago, and and it, you know hasn't gone away uh, in the I don't know how many years you know since the post World War II period really. And introducing into our artificial intelligence to a company is not going to make waste go away either. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, one hundred percent. That makes sense. Um, so uh, you know. You know, uh, turning to some of your books, really, uh, from this book of yours called A Critique of Lean, what is the more most 
overlooked aspect of lean that practitioners need to address? I know you sort of addressed it already, but would love to double click on that a little bit. Well, that that book pointed out some of the um, you know problems with lean in terms of things like why was it until 2007 that respect for people came to the forefront? Twitter wrote about it. It was granted an internal document that people didn't have access to, but the, the leaders gave speeches about respect for people, respect for humanity before 2001. Subsequently, the writings of Toyota and the founders talk about respect for people. The god of sales, uh, I forgot his name at Toyota, talked about you know respecting people. As I said, it goes all the way back to scientific management. And, you know, most people start out, of course, with just let, let's improve the process and just sort of, I'm the supervisor, here's my ideas, You let's all go do it. And people don't have buy-in. So everybody eventually figures out that you have to start listening to people, respecting people, et cetera, in order to make this work. So anyway, the book looks at things like that, that were just, you know, very late in recognizing the importance of these things within the lean construct. Um, so it talks a lot about things, understanding the fundamental importance of Kaizen. Um, it, it, it makes some early forays into, you know, why leaders resist, reject, and ignore lean management. But I've done a lot of work since then to really uh, elaborate on that in a tremendous way. Um, things like the objective of just-in-time has been lost. Uh, you know, uh, you, you with, this, with the COVID-19, you there were all kind of articles about how just in time failed, but hardly anybody was actually doing just in time. <laughs> just to, during, you know, during COVID and post COVID, just in time was merely a, a substitute word for um, a supply chain uh, bottlenecks, right. and and uh, it wasn't really presented that way. But that's what people were really trying to say by using the phrase just in time that you have all these bottlenecks occurring and so they don't understand just in time in the toyota sense of it and using it as a substitute for bottlenecks was wrong and that created more confusion and so on anyway so critique of lean is essentially you know just critiquing lean and saying what what you know what it, what has it done right what is it done wrong and how has that affected you know how we understand lean through the years uh, and that, that book by the way i was a couple some very prominent people in lean world um, hated it. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, one guy said you should take it off the market. Another guy got really agitated right. because I was criticizing the work of Womack and Jones and so forth. And it's like, oh, you know, but today, that, what are we? That was 2017. So, you know, seven, eight years later, people are re recognizing how good that book really was. Yeah. There is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Bob, uh, you, you've written about this one as well. Uh, how can organizations adapt lean principles to different cultural contexts without losing that core essence of it? I think you that, know, I'm, you yeah, know. yeah. I I don't see the cultural, um, you know, culture is really being the problem. the The problem is the preconceptions that people have, and this is something that Ono talked about. Uh, you know, here and there in his books. And that is something that always caught my attention when he said that. Um, and I thought it was very important. And by the way, that was a good translation of what he meant was preconceptions. You lose things in translation sometimes. Um, but, um, and I recently wrote a book called The Change Perspective that finally, you know, I wanted to get around to that for years to write about this point about preconceptions and finally did it there. But anyway, the problem is the preconceptions that people have, and they're largely the same across countries when it comes to things like business, leadership, management, um, work, uh, and workers. It's pretty much the same globally. And some of that is the influence of US style, you know, business and leadership and management. But, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, and it's still true today, you go to so called developing countries, China, you know, 20 years ago and so forth that they had a very poor, you know, the leaders had a very strict way of leading and managing people. Um, they didn't think too highly of workers, you know, disposable uh, and that kind of thing. And that's pretty common throughout the world. And, um, you know, you have the attitudes of when people are 
presented with new ideas, particularly when they're in supervisory, you know, middle management, higher level positions, that it won't work here, as opposed to the let's try it and see. And there's exceptions to all of this, right? But as a general thing, most people say it won't work here. So a few will say, let's just try it and see. Right. Uh, most people will say, well, we're doing it this way for a reason, which is a translation of which means, you know, whatever is, is right. As opposed to other, some other small number of organizations will say, you know, we, we notice we have problems with this process. We keep improving it. So maybe really what's going on is whatever uh, is, is, whatever is, is wrong, not whatever is, is right. Um, so, so most, Bob, have you, have you well, seen examples of, of lean being successful in, in countries like China? Well, I, not personally. I mean, I haven't made the, the, the trek to China, um, you know, but there's other things going on, like, uh, you know, respecting traditions. A lot of people say just don't mess with things but, or let's revise or break the tradition. Hierarchical control versus decentralized. Do as you're told. Uh, people are the problem versus creative people being creative solution finders. Um, blame people for problems. No, let's blame the process. Individualism versus, versus teamwork. One best way versus infinite possible ways. So there are some companies who think in the, you know, in the alternate way with or without lean. Right. Uh, but there's still, um, you know, I don't see it as a cultural thing. This is just kind of the, the way humans in hierarchical economic excuse me in economic hierarchies they tend to think about leadership management work workers etc in that in this particular kind of ways and it transcends cultures uh, it's a little bit different in scandinavian countries where the the sort of the social fabric of the country enters into uh, the social fabric of the business um, and other countries i'm sure as well but by and large, it's kind of like that. Right. Yeah. Bob, Bob, can you tell a little bit, talk a little bit more about that Changing Perspectives book of yours? I haven't, I have, haven't read yeah, that. Yeah, it's titled The Change, Change Perspective. And, and, you know, it's it's subtitled something like a, a book for emerging leaders, because sometimes I get the feeling that, you know, older leaders are just not never going to get it. Um, <laughs> But it's it's okay for older leaders, you know, mid career and, and and senior leaders to to read that book as well. But yeah, so I made an early attempt at this many years ago, 2011, in a book called Moving Forward Faster to try to grasp what are the different preconceptions and categorize them: social, um, historical, economic, and political. Those four categories, because right. Ono's concern about preconceptions were essentially related to manufacturing and um, accounting so business and, and business so let's just say manufacturing and business like two categories of preconceptions around 2011 i wrote this book called moving forward faster look at the four categories of preconceptions but this latest one looks at what is it economic social political historical philosophical um, business legal aesthetic spiritual you know, so many more. And within each one of those categories, there's, you know, 10 or 15 preconceptions. Right. And that's why when people go to management and give a presentation and say, here's why we should do lean, they really only talk about, you know, three, four, five of out of the 100, 150 preconceptions that managers would have right. that run along the lines of it won't work here, whatever is, is right, hierarchical control, do as you're told, etc. And, and you know, it may, uh, what the presenter presents might answer a few of those preconceptions, but not not enough for the leader to say, yeah, I'm all in. I'm all in on lean. Let's do it. I'll, you know, I'm willing to change everything, as Art Burns says, uh, but, but most aren't. Uh, so, um, yeah, so it's not so much a cultural thing. It's the preconceptions that are pretty common in economic hierarchies. I love that. No, I, I, I absolutely love that. I'm, I'm going to order that book right now, actually. It's, it's yeah, not... I think you'll find, I mean, it was really something I'd wanted to do for many years, but just never got around to it. And finally said, I got to, I got to get this done. Yeah. No, no I, I'm a student of, of leadership as well. And in manufacturing, I know changing people's behaviors and understanding preconceptions is one of the hard, hardest changes. Well, 
Yeah. yeah. And one of the things I'm trying to get people to realize with that book is for many years, it was the, the relationship was behaviors inform competency. So if you change behaviors, you get different competencies. Mm -hmm. And in early writing, I backed it up to belief behaviors and competencies. If you want to change the competencies, changing the behaviors is not enough. You got, you have to start to affect people's beliefs. Mm -hmm. And then as time passed, it became apparent to me that something that precedes beliefs is the preconceptions that people have. So Lean World still talks way too much about behaviors. And they think that the way to get everything to change is through behaviors. And you have to back it up and get into preconceptions because that informs beliefs, which in turn informs behaviors, which in turn, in turn informs the competencies, the skills and capabilities, the things that people are good at as it affects their job in terms of its manual labor or its its, its uh, knowledge work of the senior executives, for example. Um, so I've been pushing for let's stop talking about behaviors. Let's talk about preconceptions because that's really where the root of the problem is. And and but, you know, there's it's been over 100 years that people talk about change in the context of behaviors. Right. And so it's just stuck in people's minds. Going to take some time. Makes sense, Bob. Uh, one thing that I typically end these uh, these podcasts is is what is the one thing manufacturers don't do enough of to be factory forward in twenty twenty four. Any any thoughts on that? Do you, you remember Deming talk of some quote about you know you have to have the outside view. You know you you have to you I forgot what the exact quote is, but you you have to have an an outside view. Right. Meaning you got to know what's going on outside in the outside world right. and in manufacturing and generally within a company, whatever the particular function or discipline is, you have these directives from senior management to achieve some goals and objective. You have metrics and so forth. So most people are very internally focused, busy trying to achieve that. And in doing so, they don't have an outside view. They don't know what's going on in the outside world. You're, you know, your average worker is uh, not, and I mean by salaried professional, when you just take your average lean professional, is probably not reading the Wall Street Journal every day, not understanding how the leaders think and run business, et cetera. Um, they're not seeing the latest developments in a given field. So for example, if somebody graduates with from industrial engineering program with a specialty in quality, they graduate, go to work, work in quality or work in industrial engineering. Yet they have access to their alma mater's library to, to search journals, articles, journal articles about quality, about industrial engineering, to keep up to date with what's changing. Now, it is true sometimes the academic journals lag the industry, but at other times, the ac academic journals are doing research that's ahead of industry that would be relevant to your company. So whether it's looking at what other companies are doing what's coming out of the research journals, what's coming out of trade books, uh, as far as new information and so forth, um, they need to have an outside view. Mm -hmm. And I know in my experience in industry, I mean, we had in one company I worked for, we had the strangest you know, uh, materials management system, computer system for managing materials. And th it's almost like there was, an there was an evolutionary tree of materials management uh, information technologies and R somehow like went off the tree into its own right. thing for decades. And it's like, right. what is this? Right. Why are we doing this this way? We're so far off the, off the, either the, the normal path or we haven't carved out a unique path in a good way. Yeah. We're on a unique path in a weird, bad way. And there was other things going that were going on in, in, in another organization and purchasing and getting information to suppliers was really difficult for them to get the information they needed because you don't just need the blueprint you need other documents and it was just difficult for them to get at it whereas our competition had a very simple way for the you know the um, suppliers to access information and get it pretty much instantaneously uh and so um so get, getting so an the, outside, the, the outside view. yeah, getting the outside okay. view, understand what's going on, not just within your company, but what's going on outside your company. And in the old days, companies used to hire, you know, have people on staff that were doing essentially intelligence work, market research, 
and you know intelligence gathering of what else is going on in the industry and these were were full-time jobs um at toyota i mean uh, in japan the ministry of industry and trade people rotate in that company out of they come in from companies like toyota to do research within the institute of ministry and trade and then rotate back out to their parent company and so forth and so you know this research and intelligence gathering is a very important thing and instead in u.s style business they buy it from gardner group or from yeah. some uh you know yeah. uh, research firm like that but their report is going to lack the context of your existence you yeah. should be doing it your, yourself those people should still be on staff and they're not anymore for the most part Th that's incredibly insightful really really appreciated that that bob Bob, uh, I, I had a great time learning from you, uh, and I, I'm sure our, our listeners will, will as well. Uh, thank you so much for giving you giving giving us this time, and uh, you know, ho hope we can yeah. bring you back at some point in time. And I'm gonna keep reading your books, and especially the Change Perspective one. Well, thank you, so thank much. you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Bye. thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye bye. And that's a wrap on this powerhouse episode of Factory Forward. We hope Dr. Bob Emiliani's insights have sparked some serious inspiration for your lean journey. Remember, lean isn't just a set of tools. It's a mindset that can transform every aspect of your organization. If you love this episode, share it with your network and keep the conversation going on social media using hashtag factory forward. Until next time, keep challenging the status quo and striving for excellence. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Factory Forward.